very first thing I wish to do is to thank the editor, proprietor, founder of Eyewitness News, Mr. Kenton Chance, for having carried verbatim much of what I said in the program last week. You know, media outlets are there to report news and to carry important items and I am honored that Mr. Chance should have chosen to carry much of what I said, almost all of what I said, accurately. Because judging by the comments which have been provoked by my program, it would seem as if a lot of people had not really heard what I said firsthand. And you know, in this country, we abuse the freedom of speech. We like to talk and write too much about things that we don't know much about firsthand. And especially criticize positions which you don't understand. By all means, let us exercise our freedom of speech, but let us try and get our facts right. Now, for those who don't know what I'm speaking about, let me just recap briefly. On the 1st of August, I'm Emancipation Day. A new Governor General was sworn into office, Mrs. Susan Dugan. I expect in due course she will be Dame Susan Dugan, since knighthood is ordinarily conferred on Governors General. And there arose a furor among sections of the population, criticizing the fact that a Governor General was sworn in on Emancipation Day. Now, I acknowledge the importance historically of emancipation, but it must be remembered we were not emancipated from colonialism, we were emancipated from slavery. That is the first point I want to make. Our forefathers were technically freed. Not absolutely. If when the Emancipation Bill was going through the British Parliament, and I would remind all of you that those who clamored for the slaves to be emancipated and set free from slavery were all white people. You didn't have any black people in the British Parliament at that time calling for emancipation. It was done by liberated and enlightened white people who had campaigned against slavery, and we thank them for that. Now, if at the time when that Emancipation Bill was going through the British Parliament, somebody had said, look, I don't like the bill because It has a grace period of four years before the slaves are actually free and because slave owners will have to be paid compensation for their former slaves. The whole point about that exercise was the conferring of freedom on human beings from the condition of slavery. And never mind that there was a four-year grace period and the compensation paid to the slave owners. It marked the end of slavery in the British colonial possessions. But we still continued on the colonialism. And that is important. In the, the hundred and more years before 2002, 
Emancipation Day was celebrated on the first Monday in August. And I well remember as a child, August Monday was a big holiday in St. Vincent at the time. It was a colony at the time, a pure crown colony. And everybody looked forward to August Monday. We had school treats and sang songs and so on. Then in about 2002, when the new government came in, the ULP government came in, they said, look, let us change Emancipation Day from the first Monday in August to the first of August, whenever that day falls. And so, since 2002, Emancipation Day is on August 1. Now, there is nothing sacred about Emancipation Day, important as it was. It is not a holy day. It is an important day, yes, but let us be frank. When last have we made a fuss about what we do on Emancipation Day? What have we done to symbolize the importance of emancipation? It's a day when people go to the beach and do other things. But the point I made in response to this needless furor about why should you swear in a governor general on Emancipation Day, the day that commemorated the freedom from slavery. There is, to my mind, given the affirmation by this country that this country wants to keep the monarchy, there's no inconsistency with swearing in the Governor General on Emancipation Day. In terms of protocol, the most important office in this whole governance setup is that of Governor General. And nothing could be more important than the appointment of somebody to fill that office in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. It takes precedent as a matter of protocol over everything else. People have said, oh, Mr. Campbell, it is true we voted against the proposed new constitution in the referendum of November 25, 2009, but there were other things in the referent in the constitution we didn't like and those were the things we voted against. Well come on, come on, don't don't come with that. Turn and come again. In that referendum, the most important question, the fundamental question, the earth shaking question, was the question of the removal of the monarchy from the headship of state of St. Vincent the Grenadines and creating our own presidency as a republic. That was the fundamental question in this constitution which was proposed at the time. There were other changes that were made. Changes like the bringing in of an integrity commission, the human rights, commission, the ombudsman and other things. Many changes. In fact, I will tell you in a while that I tabulated them in a publication which I will talk about in a few minutes. But the central feature of this exercise was to replace the monarchy with a republican form of government headed by our own president. In other words, we wanted to repatriate our constitution and we wanted to get rid of colonialism. That is what the people asked to do. And if anybody tells me now they didn't understand that that was the fundamental question and all other questions were simply peripheral or consequential or cosmetic, then I was sadly mistaken when I thought people understood 
that the fundamental reason for this new constitution was to change the system of governance and to replace the British monarchy from the headship of state. What we were asking, when I say we, I mean those who proposed the acceptance of the new constitution in the referendum, what we were asking Vincentians to do is to follow the lead of Caribbean countries like Guyana, Trinidad and Tobago, Belize, and Dominica. Not Belize, sorry, Dominica, which have changed their constitutions to remove the monarchy, remove the British monarchy, and to install their own heads of state in the form of their president. Now, since Dominica became a republic and have their own president, has anybody heard of any massive dislocation going on in Dominica that were not caused by natural causes like the hurricane? Has Dominica gone to the dogs? No. But Dominica has its own homegrown presidency and Dominica is no longer under the British crown. The British, the Queen of, of the United Kingdom is no longer Queen of Dominica as she used to be before Dominica became a republic. And that is what we were asking the people of this country, that let us put colonialism aside. Not the same thing as freeing of slaves. We were freed, yes, from physical bondage and from legal bondage. But as Bob Marley has been trying to drum into our heads, we have to emancipate ourselves from mental slavery. That is the emancipation we should be striving for. Not trying to cling on to the British crown and the other appendages of colonialism. And I will speak about the Privy Council in that context in the next program. Because it is the same mental slavery that has been responsible for us saying we want to cling on to the British Privy Council instead of going to our own Caribbean Court of Appeal because we lack confidence in our own people. We have a sense of inferiority. That is what we should liberate ourselves from. So as long as we insist on keeping the Queen we have to respect the importance of the institution of head of state. We can't have Queen Elizabeth as our queen and our head of state and frown upon the appointment of her success of her representative in St. Vincent Grenadines on Emancipation Day. Many of us campaigned our hearts out at the time of the referendum. But when the people voted no overwhelmingly, we had to accept the result. We had to say, this is what Vincentian wants. Don't tell me that the Constitution had in other things. And those are what we voted against. Well, I, mean, you think? <laughs> I don't understand that argument at all. You first look at what is fundamental what is earth shaking about the new constitution? And if you agree that you want to move from colonialism, other things are peripheral. Other things are consequential. The main idea is getting away from the British monarchy. Never mind you may have quarrels with the Boundaries Commission or the Integrity Commission or this and that in the Constitution. Nobody is expecting everybody to agree with everything in the Constitution. We on the Constitution Review Commission, the CRC, not everybody in the CRC agreed with everything that was eventually found its way into the new Constitution. Some persons disagreed on some issues in the Constitution, but in the spirit of democracy, 
we went along adopting the consensus approach. Because it is hard to find a revised constitution where everybody is going to agree with everything. You have to leave room for some disagreement, but on the fundamental question of the removal of the monarchy, there can be no doubt. Now, you don't have to take my word for it. Let us see what the outer world thought and made of our referendum project. What was the view held by the outside world? Well, I will give you what the outside world thought. If you take the time after this program and Google St. Vincent and the Grenadines referendum 2009, just Google that. You will see a lot of articles as a result of the Google search. And you will come across bright and early articles by Wikipedia. Now, Wikipedia is the world's encyclopedia. It's the electronic encyclopedia that is most popular and authoritative in the world. And when Wikipedia writes something, you can take it as factual because they check and double check and their articles are authored by the most scholarly of authors. So you can follow information on Wikipedia and take it that that is basically correct. This is the entry you will read if you go on your computer after this program and see what Wikipedia representing the rest of the world had to say about our referendum. I will read you what they had to say very shortly. A constitutional referendum was held in St. Vincent and the Grenadines on the 25th November 2009. Voters were asked whether they approved of a new constitution which would have replaced the constitution in force since independent in 1979. The proposal was supported by only 43.13% of voters in the referendum well short of the required two-thirds threshold. And this, these are the words I want you to listen to and read for yourself. If approved, the proposed constitution would have abolished the monarchy of St. Vincent and the Grenadines headed by Queen Elizabeth II and would have given more power to the opposition. The referendum was the first of its kind to be held by a member of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States. Wikipedia reflecting the views of the world. If approved, the proposed constitution would have abolished the monarchy of St. Vincent and the Grenadines headed by Queen Elizabeth II and would have given more power to the opposition. So that as far as the rest of the world was concerned, the referendum was about the removal of the monarchy first and foremost and fundamentally. Not about this, that and the other inconsequential matters. The world saw it as St. Vincent and the Grenadines voting to keep the Queen as its head of state. You can't get around that. So don't come and tell me there were other things and if, if people had been given the chance to vote on different things, they would have voted differently. Let me, let, me, let me refute that right now. Dr. Alexis, who came here as our expert, assisting with the drafting, in fact, he drafted the new constitution subject to the guidance of parliament and the CRC. He went back to Grenada. 
disappointed, of course, that St. Vincent had gone that way. And the Grenada government decided, okay, they will try to amend their constitution as well and have a new constitution. So having listened to comments in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Dr. Alexis, heading the Grenada CRC, decided, you know what? We're not going to put the entire constitution to the referendum as was done in St. Vincent because people might reject the whole constitution because they didn't like one or two items in the constitution. So the Grenada government was persuaded to break up their referendum into seven different subjects. So let us ask the people to vote on these one by one rather than lumping them together in one. Those seven subjects were the CCG, the Election Boundaries Commission, provision to ensure the appointment of a leader of the opposition, having a fixed date for election, number four, changing the name of the state of Grenada from Grenada to Grenada, Caracol, and Betty Martini. Six, new rights and freedoms, or at least enhanced human rights and freedoms. And seven, limiting the term of the office of the Prime Minister. So when the Grenadians went to vote in their referendum on the 24th of November 2016, they had to vote for each item separately. The Grenadian electorate rejected every one. Which is surprising because this is an electorate that a short while before had given the government all 15 seats in their House of Assembly. And you would have thought that new government, all 15 seats, the opposition campaigned in Grenada against all these proposals. And the people went along and rejected each and every one. And then people said, well, people probably didn't understand the question of the CCJ. So the Grenada people went back at it again. And on the 6th of November 2018, they had another referendum, this time on the CCG alone. The Grenadian voters rejected that too. <laughs> so when people get in a rejection mood, they will reject it and then find excuses on what many people in St. Vincent now are, are trying to do is find excuses for having rejected the proposal to get rid of the monarchy. I will be doing a third program next week, BV, to continue this discourse, because I have a lot of materials. I promise you, now some of you might remember this document. It's called 60 Significant Improvements in the Proposed 2009 Constitution. It has in an itemized list of the 60 improvements that we are proposing. And it has all the correspondence between the opposition and the government, which led to the opposition removing themselves from the process. You may say, well, you never heard of this before. You never heard of this before? This was published in all three newspapers as a pullout before the referendum. You just had to pull it out the Vincent in the news and search light. <laughs> Maybe you didn't bother to read it, but I hope the government will accept the proposal I plan to make to them to have it republished just as it is without any change so that you can see what it is that was proposed in the new constitution and you can see exactly how come the opposition left the process because some people say the government refused to accept suggestions from the opposition and therefore they left. Nothing on that kind. You will see exactly why the opposition left the process. And the final remark I want to make, 
I hold both the NDP and the ULP responsible for the failure of the referendum. I hold NDP responsible for acts of commission and they hold ULP responsible for acts of omission. But I will elaborate on that next Monday, DP. So until then, I hope you will meditate on these matters. Go and do your research, man. There are many, many things you will find if you took the trouble to go and simply search the world, the world wide web. Well, that is all from this program with the law new program number 946.